Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dining time is here. That's right, we're talking Season 1, Episode 4 of Animal on Dish by Dish. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from the wilds of Baltimore, Maryland. This is the Dish by Dish podcast where we watch every episode of Hannibal and talk about it. And as always, there's only one person I trust to dose me correctly with psychotropic drugs before we have breakfast for dinner. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I can't even make jokes about this episode. It just shakes me up so bad. Uh, yes, this is going to be the... <laughs> This is going to be like if, a therapy. This is going to be like a therapy circle. <laughs> it should be noted the episode title is "If," um, and uh, to my French-speaking fans, all three of you, uh, I uh, apologize for mispronouncing. Of course, that's no worse than me mispronouncing Minnesota Shrike for two episodes in a row. <laughs> Shrike with an S and an H. Sh -sh not strike uh, like the Baltimore Orioles are playing. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this was <laughs> I can see why uh, in April of 2013, uh, just shy of uh, yet another uh, school shooting, this time in an elementary school, that this uh, was deemed perhaps not ready for prime time on NBC. This is the roughest episode of the show. <laughs> yeah, this one's like like if you're not you know kind of staring at your ceiling after you know, you know while sleep proves elusive. <laughs> right. <laughs> you might be a sociopath. Uh it is haunting. It is very well done. Um and I think because it's so effective um it it was I don't know when would be the right time to release this episode, to be honest with you, because um, while I applaud the idea and the commitment to doing it, the end results are so disheartening in so many ways. And it ends it just the whole thing is a never ending bummer. <laughs> yeah, it is bleak. It really, really is. I mean, uh, just a quick, you know, plot breakdown. Of course, our, our killer of the week uh, were introduced to uh, their victims. Uh, we don't know, who, you know, if it's a man, woman, or a group. Turns out to be a group. But at first, they're just thinking it's a killer. And uh, the, the killer uh, kills <laughs> an entire family, what appears to be all at the same time. Uh, it turns out uh, there are actually three of the, the four people are killed at once. And then the fourth one is killed after uh, at the dining room, uh, the din uh, dining room table. And no one finds their bodies for a really long time. It's we open on maggots and then they start talking about how the uh the line of where the, the gunshot came from is from a very short person and your heart starts to sink. Yep. And it and only it, continues sinking from there. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have to dig it up in the backyard, one wonders if you have a heart. <laughs> this is truly a dire episode. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is. Like I said, I don't, I'm not going to turn this into a therapy uh, uh, session, but, but, it was a, let's it, in several ways to, to test the notion of what a family is yes. in the kind of most darkest negative way possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean this this feels like straight out of some sort of dystopian Stephen King novel. Like yeah. it is, it's a little culty. It's mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's you kind of you know a little. You know, taking something from, you know, column A and column B, if one was horrifying and the other column would be more horrifying than that. Yeah. Yes. And it's not, it's played absolutely straight. 
and I think a lot of shows would have tr- attempted some form of wink to it. No, no, not this one. It is it is bleak and serious. Yes. And and I think it's uh, in a way I I I'm not going to we won't you know assuming that you know people who are listening to this some of them are watching for the first time. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure do we want to say who plays the killer in it cuz it's a really bizarre casting. Um I I I think I mean we've done spoilers in every episode. It's I, Molly Shannon. Yeah. Which is which is I I don't think I'm, I'm pretty sure her casting was announced, but but they didn't say who she was going to play or what was going to no. happen to her. I think I, I I did a little bit of research and uh, uh, apparently the the assumption was that she was going to play a victim, oh. and oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's no, no. basically kind of like like a little bit of a fagin from 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 oliver twist mm-hmm. but way worse than that yes i mean uh, what the what sort of came to me uh, because they begin to call the group the lost boys because they eventually figure out uh through fingerprints that these are all lost children or missing children uh, with an emphasis towards assuming that they have been, in fact, abducted. And so if they are the Lost Boys, to me, she is the darkest timeline Wendy. Because right. she's assuming a motherhood role that she does not have of a makeshift family and enforcing rules upon them and expecting them to follow. And they do. To And when they do not, they end up in... Uh, the fireplace. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in a way, I, I kind of wanted to see how her 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 you know how this works mm. because apparently she just convinces these boys that are you know, maybe ten or twelve years old that that their parents aren't their real parents to 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 the point where she eventually agrees to get them gets them to agree to kill them. Yeah. And I'm just, I, you don't see, you don't really see any of that. You, you kind of see she's traveling around this group of boys and sort of acting motherly to them. But you know that something's not right because of the way some of the kids are reacting to her. And I, I, I noted that I kind of wanted to see how it worked. But in, in a rare instance in this show, like, you don't get any kind of insight into her. They, yeah. They're kind of more focused into. Uh, they're focused more on the boys than on her. So you really get. I'm not even sure she was even given a name. No, she's listed as the woman. Yeah. Uh. So she, the absence of her motivation beyond that one, you know, diner scene, it really comes across that she's twisting these kids, and I think she's being helped somewhat. By the kid who's been there the longest. Right, he's a little older than than the than the other boys. He kind of has a sort of Jake Gyllenhaal and Donnie Darko look about him, like sort yes. of like you know thousand yard stare. Yeah, absolutely, a thousand yard stare is a very good uh, description of him. But he seems to have been the most under her sway, and as a result, everyone else is sort of he's the uh, I probably the enforcer to some degree, you know, and. It's all tragic. It's just all tragic because none of these kids should be in this situation. She's obviously the huge villain here, but they have been twisted into doing some horrific things. And in the end, this one kid's like, well, I wasn't really going to do that to my parents. (laughs) And the head and Jack Crawford's like, yeah. Well, you're gonna have to convince a lot of people. Of he's that. like, he's like, almost a bit away saying, "Yeah, tell it to the judge." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really stark. And yeah. then to pair that with the introduction of Jack's wife, uh, you know, four episodes in, the very last thing, and he's like, "Hey, is it too late for us to have children?" And she's like, "Too late for me." And you're like, "Oh my god." How could this get any darker? <laughs> yeah, this... and then you've got, uh, um, you know, like I said, the whole episodes focus on people for better or for worse, you know, all in these cases worse, yeah. kind of creating their own sense of family. Yeah, I started writing it down, all of the 
family themes that are running through not the the the, the series in general, but very specifically pointedly, in this episode. Yeah. Very specifically in this episode, you have Will and Hannibal as brothers, but both Will and Hannibal attempting to be the foremost surrogate father to uh, the daughter of the Minnesota Ab- Shrike Abigail. Abigail. Yeah. <laughs> then you have um, Will as the head of his own dog family, which is very sp- uh, explicitly noted as some sort of Fagin. And then you have Jack Crawford as the stern father figure of the BSU. And then you have that one scene where they're all talking about their own home life. And you have Kat saying, oh, I was the firstborn. And I was the most responsible and no one underneath, like the youngest got away with murder. Then you have Price revealing that he was a twin and saying, who wouldn't want two of me? <laughs> <laughs> That's like the closest you get to the whole episode of comic relief. Yes. Like that one, one, scene. one wisecrack. Yeah. And then Zeller saying that he was that, you know, I thought middle children were the problem, denoting that he's a, a middle child. Uh, and then uh, Graham saying, "Yeah, they don't know where to fit in, so they'll 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 try to fit in anywhere," which perhaps fall you know explains him uh, revealing information to Freddie Lowndes. So it it's all layered, man. This is a real layer cake. Only if we were to go back to uh, Kill by Kill uh, uh, very early on. It's a sad sandwich. <laughs> it's possibly the saddest of sandwiches. The saddest of sandwiches is what's happening here. Um, and it, it all comes across uh, it, very artfully. And it's very thoughtful. It's not super exploitative. But holy hell, does it just burrow into your brain and make you think bad thoughts oh yeah absolutely absolutely you, like you start questioning like the choices you made and like your own like quote-unquote surrogate families and you know why what was i why was i drawn to these people or this yeah. person or you know what part were they actually what missing parts are they actually filling in for me and you know it gives you a, a lot of unpleasant food for thought <laughs> and this and y- yet Hannibal is usually the place where we go for pleasant food. And yeah. we finally, I think we, we, you know, the, again, I, you know, the show isn't exactly made for people who are you know, unfamiliar with, with uh, Hannibal Lecter as a character, mm-hmm. but, but, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent that he is feeding his victims to people. Yes. Uh, because I think uh, he he has uh, Crawford over, and Crawford's like, "What are we eating?" And uh, I think like, I don't know. I don't know about you, Patrick. I, I'm yeah. not a I'm not a picky eater. But if someone puts a plate of meat down in front of me and doesn't tell me what it is, <laughs> I'm just gonna be like, mm, "You know, I'm gonna have the salad." <laughs> you, know? like, you shouldn't have to ask what it is. Yes. And yet, so many people he gives them something, and it's like it's like they're already eating it. It's like, mm, what is this? You know? <laughs> it's like, and, and, well, and I, he, he says it's rabbit, but it's a guy yeah. chasing a guy who chased around the woods. <laughs> I this I think the first glance we get at him, at least, uh, well the just, long the longs in the first episode. Right. Yeah, I mean obviously we know that he's eating people. We know the character for but sure. The, but the I think the movie is, the, the series is trying to you know, kind of parcel that aspect out a little bit. And but this is the first time we've seen even a hint of him actively hunting a person, right? Whereas before it's kind of been like illusion. You 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 slap two disparate uh, incidents together, so and your knowledge of Hannibal Lecter fills in the blanks, right? Exactly. Whereas here he's asking, "What is this?" and he says, "Rabbit," and you instantly see some guy running for his life in the woods, and then Crawford saying. Should have run faster. Yes, he <laughs> <Man>. should have. <laughs> yes, he should have. Oh my god! Uh, again, um, a, a brief, you know, little sliver of humor in what it is otherwise a very humorless, or, or at the very least, it, it's just so dark. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, not grim dark, but just truly, when you think about it makes you think very unpleasant thoughts and 
while the show, you know, over the course of its three seasons shows you plenty of grossness or uh, scary moments. Or yeah, wait till, ne- wait till the next episode. Right. Um, but here, I think it's infinitely more effective and psychological. It just it just feels like an invasion. Yeah, they he know they know how much they can get away with showing. You never actually show any of the 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 kids shooting their parents. But when they just particularly when they describe what happened to the the, the boy who ends up basically burned to death, they mm-hmm. apparently shot him and tossed him into a fireplace because why yeah. not? Um, like that, his mother apparently suffered. And yeah. he couldn't deal with that, so he, I think they said he got hysterical or something, and 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 so they shot him too. And they don't show any of that, but just you know, thinking about that and thinking that this is a kid, and it's just like like you know, the, the shudder just you know moves down your spine, right? Um, because so much of it is very fantasy based. Like right. when we get into our next episode, it's it's so fantastical that. You're kind of allowed to go. All right, uh, this is this is a little silly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's more allegory than it is true police procedural. You know, it, this is a weird amalgam of a lot of things that I genuinely like in in a bunch of TV shows. You have a lot of X Files going on here. It's very matter of the fact, but and you sort of have also that Buffy element of whatever they're chasing reflects their condition at the at that particular moment and here we see that reflected in the family units but that will continue and so you meld those elements of making the real emotions fantastical or at least out of the ordinary and here uh, it, usually it's like interesting and exciting and you know it, repulsive, but this is one of those that just crawls inside your soul and says, "Think about this at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> or don't <laughs> <laughs> if you if you ever want to sleep again." Yes, uh, and l- like we said at the top, uh, this uh, episode was not shown. Uh, when it was supposed to, this was supposed to be the number four uh, episode, uh, was pulled. Uh, and I think they made the right choice there. They did. And it's interesting because um, if you were to skip over this episode, and, and you shouldn't because it's, it's very well done. It's just, yes. it's, just, it's just deeply, deeply, deeply A lot of content unsettling. warnings have to be yeah, at the top it of it. Very unsettling. Yes. Um, but should you want to skip it? You're actually not going to miss any of the, the, the core plot arc. Yes, Jack Crawford's wife is introduced, but she's literally in it for about 30 seconds. Yeah. She has a, a much bigger role in the, in the next episode. And you, I don't think you're going to see her and like, wait, well, who's this character? Oddly yeah. enough, I think this was my first time watching it. Because the only things that I had seen from it previously had been an online exclusive of like, of plot elements that they had edited out of the episode and allowed you to watch on NBC.com. Yeah, I I saw this one when they when it was on Amazon because I never uh, I didn't actually watch much of it when it was in its original run. I, I caught up with it when it was on Amazon, and yeah, it still makes the exact same impact <laughs> that it did the first yeah. time I watched it. It's uh wow, I, <laughs> I'm kind of blown away by it. Um, I. Th- you really have to give it to there's that one scene in a convenience store and you can they're on their way from one murder to the next and this kid is the the youngest kid there is freaking out at this possibility and the oldest kid is watching him from behind a stack of t- uh, two liter sodas and he just is so frightened he pisses his pants and Molly Shannon could not act nicer in that moment. She just seems like a mom who's like, Oh my goodness. Are you okay? You know, her first thing is like, are you okay? This is embarrassing. Oh, what? It's embarrassing. You shouldn't be embarrassed. I am embarrassed. Like, it's like, Oh, you seem like a, a human being with a soul, 
but obviously you do not have one. Right, and that's what makes it you know interesting and, and probably a good call that we, we don't know anything about her. What explanation would satisfy us? Right, because they're not they they're not focused on you. Know, I think partially it might be a, a little bit you know the sort of reverse sexism where they never assume a woman does any of this, mm-hmm. which you know I don't. But it doesn't even occur to them that there might be like an adult ringleader kind of kind of you know, guiding these kids along and and you know encouraging them to do this. They are very hyper focused on it just being this band of children running around and like like killing their parents yeah i it's i don't they don't know where to start and i think the the revelation that they're missing kids and that there is a mother figure involved happen one after the other they're they're not widely divided by time i think the only thing that's really in there that sort of takes up a little bit of the space is that Hannibal uh, takes Abigail out of uh, the uh, asylum or mental hospital or whatever she's in. It's the same place he ends up. Uh, But he takes her back for dinner and then says, you know what we should do here is you should take uh, mushrooms. Let's do some shrooms. Let's do some (laughs) shrooms. And I'm going to I'm going to help you. Okay, Doc. I'm going to be your guide. <laughs> I think this will really be great for you. <laughs> and then she starts tripping out looking at a bowl of fruit. And he's like, it's all going to work out. Let me tell you about, um, you know, we're going to have breakfast for dinner. And I'm making I love eggs. breakfast for dinner. Yeah. Hence the oeuf, which is French for eggs. And eggs, motherhood. Oh, it's all woven together it is a yeah and especially when we when when will just casually mentions that he doesn't have a mother yeah like we he had a father but but you know his mother we don't know no nobody knows what what her story is no and that he you know he had to follow his dad from place to place because he did couldn't seem to find a job there's a there's a lot going on here man it it is deep and it's, uh, it, of course, Alana finds out that uh, Hannibal has taken uh, Abigail out of out of the uh, institution. And then she's mad and, and she says that was rude. And he seems legitimately shook by it. Like, oh, someone's calling me on the same bullshit that my, I my eat word. people by. <laughs> Me? Rude? Me? I served oh. my orange juice out of a pitcher, I'll have you know. <laughs> and can, and can I say, like, I know I know there's been a lot of there's a lot of focus on, on how well the food is shot in, in, mm-hmm. in this in this show. That pitcher of orange juice looks so fucking good, man. I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Orange it, and purple it, look great together and that, that dining room is so purple that yeah. I, I think it really makes it yeah, pop. Yeah, I was just like, man, that looks so good. He, he yeah. probably hand squeezed those oranges with like the same hands he used to like you know cut somebody's lungs out. Oh boy, 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 boy! It's uh, I, I don't, I don't think we've had that. Uh, I think the the eggs here look good, but I don't think it's really until like the next episode that you really begin to see that food design. Oh yeah, really take up. It, it's, a, like, a you know, I never thought about eating people, but you know, <laughs> I mean, if, if this prepared is... the right way. If it's prepared like this, you're probably going to eat it. <laughs> and that I think that that ha- that says something to you. Um, I will say, if there's anything that totally weirds me out in this particular episode that has nothing to, to do with the plot and nothing to do with the characters necessarily, it is the collars and ties that they have dressed Hannibal Lecter in. They're so <laughs> large. So comically wide, it, it's like he's wearing some sort of 50s, you know, massive gangster tie, but with a polo shirt. It is just decidedly odd. Looks it, good on him, it's but a little, I don't it's get a, it. It's a little Dracula's cape, which, which could be, oh, yeah, which sure. I mean, I could, I would assume is somewhat intentional. Mm, I. Yes, I think almost everything in this is intentional. And I think that's why it works, and that's why it stands the test of time. I just, I just like the idea of like you know, 
he comes to help out, like he comes to help like crawl around a garage sale, and he's like wearing like you know cargo shorts and a you know t-shirt says "Federal Boob Inspector" on it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's his. That's his Saturday. That's his weekend clothing. Yeah, just a t-shirt that says "You don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps." <laughs> that sort of such. <laughs> <laughs> or just a, a an apron, you know, for him to make a meal, but it's a, a you know, a bare male chest with, with eight pack abs. <laughs> I like I, this would be great. I, if, any, if any of our listeners could draw us fan art of, of Hannibal Lecter wearing a t shirt, just <laughs> FBI federal boom. <laughs> <laughs> We have to, oh, have to lighten God. the mood a little bit. There are Just child murderers in this episode. <laughs> Forcing abducted children to kill their parents. But, you know, stay tuned for the federal boob inspector joke. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, that is a kill by kill promise. We will always lighten the mood. <laughs> Conversely, when Alana comes over earlier in the episode, uh, he's like, oh, you don't have, you don't. You don't have an appointment. He's like, no, but do you have a beer? He's like, yes. I'm like, wait a second. This TV show is so confident what it's doing. They're like, what would happen if you had a beer with Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> and these glasses they're drinking out of, they are oh, enormous. She's just like as drinking big out as of a cowboy time. boot. <laughs> Like if he went to Senior Frogs. Yeah, this is I was gonna would... say it's like a like a Cheesecake Factory souvenir class. <laughs> Ye old spaghetti factory <laughs> sized beer stein. Sure. Oh my god. Well, see, we found a way to make it comical, because guess what? Um all the choose your own death ventures are getting shot. Uh, uh, shot at war. Well, I mean, I guess he got shot before he was thrown into the fireplace. Yes. Okay. But, I mean, yeah, it's the weapon of choice. I think they're just disposing of the body or making a point of it all. But that kid was definitely shot. Um, so it's either shot at the dinner table, shot at, at the around the Christmas tree, or shot at the barbecue. <laughs> Those are your choices. <laughs> So it really depends on the location you would like to meet your end. So, Gina, what say you? Uh, let's, let's let's take the festive approach. I'll go shot at Christmas time. Yeah. No, that's the best way to do it, even though the whole place is going to end up smelling like uh, charred uh, human flesh. Uh, it, it'll also have a, just a tinge of pine. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm with a little bit of Christmas tree saison on top of it all. Uh, that's the only way to go. I don't want to like that dining room ta- table in the first thing. It's fucking ridiculous. I hate all that wood. Ugh. Yeah. Blah, blah. No, thank you. Uh. Uh-uh. Sitting Not down for, for one of those like one of those inexplicably extravagant family dinners, like at the end of Mikey. Yeah, like what are where they, they eating? Were, like something out of a brontosaurus? It's like they yeah, bring it to say, Fred Flintstone let's at have, the end. Of- you know, let's have an entire entire ass roast beef for four people. <laughs> Oh, my God, this has driven me to drink. Um, That just about does it. Uh, Next week, we'll be back with Kill by Kill, and then the week after, episode five of Dish by Dish. Uh, Follow us on socials. Uh, Gina, where can people find you? Uh, You can find me on Twitter under Porcelain72, or uh, I do some movie and TV writing at thespool.net. Do it today, people. Check it out. We're on Twitter. Uh, We're on Facebook. We have the page, which is more of an announcement thing. And then we have the group, which is, you know, starting. We're starting to have people talk about episodes, uh, talk about. uh, And Dish by Dish is really helping with that because I think people are watching along with us. And uh, it's a great place to discuss that. So join us there. We're also on Instagram. Rate and review us on iTunes. Retweet us, uh, share us with friends, um, force us on your family. This is a great place to start because it's such a lighthearted episode. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you want to watch a fun show? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Join us on Patreon for more cool shit. And um, yeah, we got a lot of stuff coming your way. Uh, Until next time, uh, for myself and for Gina, bye-bye, everybody. Bye.